Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the house of the Lord. We are more than privileged for yet another opportunity to praise and worship the only living God. Our prayer this morning is that by the time we leave the sanctuary, we would be refreshing to face the week ahead. For those who are sick and need the healing touch of the greatest physician the world has ever known, we pray that healing would be your portion. For those who are lonely, may he be your comfort. For those who are weak, strength, he would give you enough. And for those who mourn, he would grant you comfort. And in this way, when we come back next week, we would have more and more reasons to praise and glorify his name. Sisters and brothers, let's now tune our hearts to sing the grace of this God, the only sovereign God. Stand with us, if you may.
heads as we open the service in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that we could come before you this morning. Lord, we know that this is a privilege that we have to be found again in the house of the Lord. Lord, we thank you that we come to worship our great and only Father. Lord, we thank you that you are God, you're our creator, you're the giver of life. And Lord, this morning we want to glorify you, we want to lift our eyes upon you, Lord, and we want to sing all praise unto you alone. Lord, be with us, Lord, and help us to, to just clear our minds and focus our attention on you this morning. Lord, I pray for all aspects of our morning service. I pray for our children upstairs as they fellowship and they worship and they come towards their lessons as well. I pray, Lord, that all that we do and hear this morning, may it find an abiding place in our hearts, Lord, that we will leave this place this morning much richer than we have come, in, come before. Help us, Lord, to grow closer and closer to you each and every day and each and every second of our life, help us to find all dependence on you and you alone. We ask this in your holy and precious name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you again into this building because we are the church and we form the church and we just come into the building to worship and praise and glorify our God together. And if you are here for the first time, I did meet someone here today who is joining us for the first time. We do welcome you and may you also find much warmth and love amongst us and do feel uh, free to uh, worship with us this morning. You'll also have a time later on to introduce yourself so, um, so that we can get to know you. But I trust that everyone had a blessed week and um, that we come together as one big family to worship our living God this morning. And we, as uh, Victor welcomed us also, that um, may we leave here much stronger, much blessed uh, um, today. I would like to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, <coughs> and reading from verse 7. And it reads, to keep, me from, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing grace, great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest in me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. And we thank the Lord for giving us this reassurance that life here is not easy, it will never be easy, but with Him, we are great, and we can boast about the suffering that we go through. I'll hand you back to the worship team. Thank you, Slen. You would agree with me that the gospel is under more and more attack. False teachings and practices are on the rise. We, as soldiers of the cross, should we surrender grudgingly? Not at all. This is the time we need to go down on our knees and pray ceaselessly more than ever before. The education systems are also under threat. And we worry about the education of our children. But there's one thing we should bear in mind. The Lord would give us victory on to victory and on to victory. He has made us more than conquerors. Let's not despair. Let's not be broken hearted. Let's pray and pray and pray. Victory is ours. We have a God. He is sovereign on the 
whatever circumstances that may befall us. He would keep us. Let's put on the full armor he has given us. If we trust our own strength, we would fail. Brothers and sisters, let's stand up and lift the banner of the gospel high.
may be seated. The ushers would go around with the offering baskets, and as they do, we would be singing, give them all to Jesus, reminding us to give all our worries to Jesus. Ushers. <laughs> said you want to see sunshine he never said there'd be no rain he only promised a heart full of singing and a very thing the ones broke give them all to Jesus, shut the dreams, scooted hearts, and broken toys. Give them all, give them all, give them all to Jesus, and He will turn your sorrows into joy. Give them all. Jesus, shattered trees, wounded hearts, and broken toys. Give them all, give them all, give them all to Jesus, and He will turn your sorrows into joy. And He will turn your sorrows into joy. Thank you.
Let's bow our heads as we come before the Lord in a time of congregational prayer. Lord Jesus, our Father, the creator of heaven and earth, we come before you this morning and we bow before you this morning. For we know that you have made us You've made us in your image and you've instilled in us your spirit. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us, Lord. Strengthen us, strengthen, strengthen us from within. I pray, Lord, that even in our weakness, that you would make us clean. Lord, we are sinners, but because of your grace, we can be made clean. Daily, we, we fall, we stumble, and we sin. Lord, we ask that you may forgive us. Clean our hearts, Lord, so that you may find our hearts a sweet dwelling place for you. Lord, help us to walk a path that's pleasing to you. Help us, Lord, to cling to you when days are difficult, when temptations come before us. Give us the strength, Lord, that we so need. Lord, help us to know the love that you've given to us. Help us to know the vastness of your love. Lord, help that us to have that love to abide within us. That we could reflect this love to others that come on our path. Lord, help us to be a reflection of you in our daily lives. Grant us, Lord, the boldness to share Christ, to speak about you, to share the joy that you give to us. Lord, we know that even you haven't promised a life of without hurt or trials or difficulties. But Lord, we know that we can have the inner peace which comes from you. And Lord, this peace we could also share with others, Lord. Grant us this ability to do that. Help us to reflect you in our lives. We thank you for this church. We thank you that we have each other, a family that you've put us in. I pray, Lord, that we would continue to grow stronger for you. Guide us in all that we need to do as a church. Direct our paths, I pray. Lord, we pray for each and every ministry area of this church and every leader in these ministry areas that you'd give wisdom that only comes from you. Lord, I pray for families in this church that are ill. We pray for a healing touch, Lord, that only can come from you. We pray for those that are feeling de depressed, Lonely, we pray for your comfort and strength. We pray for those that are seeking employment or in financial difficulties. We pray for your provision, Lord. We pray for marriages, Lord, that are challenging. Lord, be with these couples. 
I pray for every home, Lord, that you would be the center of our homes. That you would lead each and every home. You would direct each and every home. I pray for parents, Lord, that they would help the children draw closer to you, to nurture and to guide. And uh, Lord, I pray for many young parents, Lord, who have challenging days, tiring nights. I pray for your strength upon them. And Lord, I just pray for us as a congregation that we will always have the desire to be closer to you, to draw closer to you, to study your word and make it our everyday, part of our everyday life, Lord, to want to draw closer and to know you more. Lord, I pray for our pastor, we thank you for him. We thank you for Hanley. Continue to be with them. Strengthen them, I pray. And as he will bring us the message now, Lord, I know you've prepared this on his heart. Prepare our hearts as well, Lord, to be responsive of this message. And Lord, that we would reflect on it. And Lord, that we will use it to grow our lives and draw closer to you. Be with the furtherance of the service, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Did anybody here recognize that song from the 70s and 80s? Kind of dated me, give them all to Jesus, but beautiful words. Was I the only one who remembered that song? Come on, own up to it, some of you older folk. <laughs> Okay, we're continuing in 2 Timothy, and uh, if you're not with us, uh, this is a very urgent letter. It's uh, Paul's last letter uh, to Timothy uh, to prepare him uh, for the realism of the Christian life. Um, and uh, we know we've, we've looked at chapter 1, verse 14, for example. Uh, part of our responsibility is to think of the next generation. It's not just about us. Church isn't just about us. So God, the good deposit, we're not allowed to, you know, uh, kind of tamper with the gospel. There's one gospel. It's God-given. Uh, we're not allowed to drop the ball. We shouldn't drop the ball. And then in uh, verse 1 of chapter 2, we're told to be strong, uh, be empowered. This is not a, I mean, stand up for Jesus, but we don't, we sang it. We don't stand in our own strength, then we're in big trouble. We need to be empowered by the grace that is given to us. And then just in case, um, just in case Timothy, you know, he's like you and me, and uh, maybe he doesn't always get it the first time. I know I don't get it the first time. That's why I've got to keep reading. Uh, uh, just in case he's wondering, what does it mean to be empowered in grace? Well, uh, Paul is going to describe the Christian life in three pictures. Actually, we're only going to get to the one today because what precedes it is uh, just as important. So uh, open your Bibles, or if you've got it on your screen, we're going to stand. That's our custom here to stand as the Word of God is read. Uh, not just to stretch our legs, but it's a sense of reverence that this is God speaking. Okay, to Timothy. Uh, we're going to read from chapter 2. Uh, I'll read to verse uh, 7, chapter 2. So 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, uh, NIV, but I'm focusing on verses 3 uh, to 4. So you then, my uh, son or my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable, and remember the word there is faithful, people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs but rather tries to please his commanding officer. And similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Please be seated. Lord, um, you don't have to give us insight, uh, but actually everything you do is of grace. Um, so thank you that you, you choose to give us insight. Uh, thank you that uh, whilst there's a sense of mystery about who you are, and we don't expect to understand all of your ways, 
Not one of us here today has 100% wisdom like you do. Whilst there's that sense of mystery, we thank you that you've made it perfectly clear, perfectly clear how you want us to live so that we may live holy and happy lives. So please change us by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, we've already recognized that this is a church of many generations. So I wonder if it rings any bells with uh, some of you when I mention the name Charles Atlas. Anybody? Okay, that really dates me. Well, when I was a kid, everybody, when I was a teenager, everybody knew who Charles Atlas was. Uh, Charles Atlas was a bodybuilder. He wasn't always a strong guy. Actually, he was a pretty much of a weakling. Uh, his real name was Angelo Siciliano, and he launched a fitness program which was aimed at uh, very thin teenage boys, and I was one of them. Uh, apparently, when he was a teenager, a uh, bully uh, uh, sort of kicked sand into his face on the beach, and of course, that's not what a young boy likes when you're on the beach, and there are those of the opposite sex around you, and uh, there's, there's no way he wanted to stay at a mere 44 kilograms. So it was a turning point in his life. He did some research. And this, uh, you can Google it, this dynamic tension program was marketed. I didn't enter into it, but I knew about it because the marketing was brilliant. Uh, although he never won an award, he never won an award, uh, he was known at that time as the world's most perfectly developed man. Now, welcome to these verses in chapter 2. And it becomes apparent why I'm calling this message muscular uh, Christianity. And yes, ladies, it's for you too as well. There's no doubt in my mind that if you love the Lord, I, I mean, if you, if you have God's spirit in you, you want to grow spiritually. It's, it's one of the indicators, by the way, if you're wondering, do I know the Lord? Do I know if I love him? My question to you is, is do you want to be more? <laughs> like, like the Lord Jesus Christ. No, uh, do, do we want to be more well-balanced? Not in a grotesque way, like some bodybuilders, but in a balanced way, as Jesus was. And let me say right from the outset that, uh, you know, there's no master key to the Christian life. When I was younger, it was uh, popular. There was a kind of teaching that said, you know, and it was based on John uh, 15, that since Jesus is the vine and we're the branches, all you've got to do, come to the living waters, yes, come to the living waters, all you've got to do is rest. Rest in Him and new life is going to flow. Let go and let Jesus. You had the sort of idea that you could let your mind go into neutral. Uh, and I think we got a bit excited about it, but we soon realized that there has to be more. Christian life, you read the New Testament, it's clear that there's got to be more. And, and, and that's why Paul's words to Timothy are very important for all of us today. See, There's no master key to the abundant life. There's no automatic pilot you know, to growing in grace. There's no desert island paradise in this world. Very realistic. So to put it in New Testament terms, we grow in God's grace not by sitting in a hot tub, you know, letting the muscles get flabby. No, no. Exercising. That's what these verses are about. And we'll come to racing and training and being equipped for the battle. So uh, let's begin with an introduction, uh, if you like, to the three pictures. And my first point this morning is that you will build spiritual muscle as you suffer well and not grudgingly. What an introduction to the Christian life. Eh? Right? I mean, talk about a marketing plan if Jesus was into marketing, which he isn't. What an introduction. Endure hardship. Literally, in the original language, suffer the bad. That's what it says. Like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So, bad suffering, really, to be a good soldier. Now, uh, please don't go wrong here. As you, as you read the Bible, it becomes clear that there are three kinds of suffering in life. There's deserved suffering sometimes. And, uh, for example, you think of, of David and the mess he got himself into when, uh, in that moment of temptation, he rejected the goodness of God and he fell into lust and his entire family suffered because of his own foolishness. There's deserved suffering. There are consequences to sin. 
And then there's innocent suffering. As I'm, as I'm speaking to you today, there are many people globally. Uh, we were reminding ourselves in the prayer meeting, you know, we, we live in relative peace. But if you read history, uh, the world's always been in war. Some kind of war. And as I'm speaking to you, there's a, a lot of blood being shed. We don't rejoice in it. We should lament it. It's an indication of the depravity of man and departure uh, from God. And there's innocent suffering. And there's plenty of that in this fallen world. But that's not what Paul has in mind. It's not that kind of suffering he's got in mind, right? Timothy, set your heart on following your commanding officer, on com following Jesus, and you'll find that like commander, like soldier. L look at Jesus and his muscular spirituality. And Timothy, by the way, look at me and look at where I am. I just tried to live a godly life. Look at where I am. I'm in prison now because I'm true, trying to be true to the gospel. And as he will say in verse 12 of chapter 3, everyone who wants, listen, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Jesus will be persecuted. Now listen, unless we pause and take that in, uh, unless we really understand it, the, the pictures that Paul is going to use, and they're not going to make a lot of sense to us. And may I, I, I say to you that that personal happiness, if you ever have thought that, living in the culture in which we're living, when you come to the New Testament, you read the New Testament, I have to say to you that personal happiness is not your right. Now, stay with me. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Hear me out. It goes against the grain. You mean, pastor, that God doesn't want me to be happy? Well, if you're a Christian, you know that the opposite is the case. God is a supremely happy God. He's always lived in happiness in eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And He wants us to share in that joy. He knows the route to happiness. But just think of the context in which Timothy was living in. It wouldn't be long before the whole Roman world would explode. And it would explode into violence. And in a couple of years, there would be a revolt by the Jewish people. And it would lead, uh, lead to a siege of Jerusalem. Uh, the temple would be destroyed. There'd be a massacre. Uh, and as all that was going on, the gospel was spreading and Christians would be dying for their faith. And do we think that when you live in a wartime situation, do you think that a single Christian would be thinking, Lord, I have a right to respect. Lord, I have a right to make decisions based on my feelings or my judgment, however that may impact others. I have a right to be happy. Quite the opposite. And let me, let me show you how Jesus nipped that kind of thinking in the bud. You remember Mark 10, and Jesus is traveling right with his disciples, uh, James and John included. And then they come to him and they say, boy, I, I wonder if I'd have the guts to say this. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Wow. They don't, they don't say, uh, we want to serve you and if needs be, suffer for you. No, 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 this is what we want. Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. And uh, before we too harden them, I think we should realize the progress they were making. By that stage, they had recognized that this Jesus is an ordinary man. I mean, this Jesus is the Messiah. And if he's the Messiah, there's got to be a banquet coming. And he's going to be enthroned. It wouldn't be cool if we could get to sit on either side of him. And you remember how Jesus responds. He says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with my baptism? And there, of course, he's speaking of his suffering. And they jump in and say, we can. And Jesus says to them, you will. You will suffer greatly. Why? Because if you take up the cross, if you want to be an earnest soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be a cost. Am I uh, exaggerating when I say that, uh, like James and John, we can easily buy into inauthentic Christianity? It, it, you know, it's very subtle. So that words like self-esteem and loving ourselves begin to creep into our vocabulary without us ever putting it through the sieve of the New Testament. Uh, years ago, I read a book by Michael Horton called Power Religion, and he quotes one uh, so-called Christian teacher uh, and this is what uh, she says, we can cherish ourselves in our lives. We can accept our wonderful selves with all of our faults and all of our strong points and all of our weak points and all of our feelings. It's the best thing we've got going for us. 
It's who we are and who we're meant to be. We are the greatest thing, she says, that will ever happen to us. Believe it and it will make your life a lot easier. I don't see a hint. Not a hint. Not a hint of Jesus Christ in those words. May I say this? I say it with great love because I, I think it can creep into our thinking and I'm speaking to myself as well. May I say that there's a modern cult of selfism that makes self the big deal. So we think that nothing can challenge my right to health and happiness. But if you're following Jesus, Timothy, suffering will be your companion. Suffer ill, Timothy. And some of you may be experiencing this right now. And, uh, and maybe as you're here today, you, you're in the battle with sin within. Until we get to heaven, we're not perfect. There's going to be a battle. We've got to be good soldiers. And you're aware of how easy it is to let angry thoughts seep into your mind or the root of bitterness in your heart. And you've got to fight it. You've got to fight it. That's what it means to be a good soldier. Men, if your eye is leading you astray, okay, <laughs> Jesus says, pluck it out. He wasn't speaking literally, of course. He's saying, go to any effort to rid yourself of what is holding you back to be a good soldier, in effect, a soldier of Jesus Christ. Suffer ill, Timothy. Get in the battle. M most people are, are happy for us to be Christians as long as we don't take it too seriously. Timothy, never become spineless, okay? N never become so comfortable to live with, as it were, that you, you lose the saltiness and, and you lose the light and the impact. And if you're earnest about it, uh, practical hardship will shape your muscles. Now, I wonder if you see the encouragement to Timothy uh, in his calling. It's easy when you're doing the right thing and when you suffer for it to, to be tempted to say, this seems to be a waste. I mean, I mean think of Timothy. Do, do you think it was easy for him? I mean, he and, and Paul really loved each other, like, like a son with a father. Do you, do you think it was easy for Timothy to watch his father in the faith in prison. What, were, what would go through his mind? And how about the disciples? How do you think they felt when, ha having seen all the good that Jesus did, they, they watch him being ridiculed and beaten up, though he's innocent, then carrying his own cross only to be hung on it? If it were only Jesus who suffered and not Paul, or if it were only Paul without being preceded by the sufferings of Jesus, Paul could have said, join me in my suffering. And actually the word me, I read it from the NIV, but it's actually not in the text. It's not in the original. This is not solo suffering. Literally, <laughs> Paul is saying, Timothy, join in suffering. Implication, there's a solidarity here. There's, a, there's an usness uh, about suffering. Suffer with us. Timothy, don't miss out on the fellowship of suffering. Here's how your faith will be credible, and this will shape your courage to be a bold minister. You know, there's, um, there's something about being crushed and going through the mill that result, results in something good. I happen to love coffee. And uh, knowing quite a few people, both in this church and in our convention of churches, I'll let you on to a secret. I get given coffee from all over the world, including Panama, and the Dominican Republic. I wonder who gives me that. <laughs> and you know what? Um, I don't have one yet, but I'm told that the most important thing to have in your kitchen, uh, apart from your kettle, is a good grinder. Good coffee grinder. Why? Because if you don't grind the beans just before brewing, any good barista will tell you that. If you don't grind the beans just before, not 10 minutes before, just before, you're not going to get the most out of the tasty coffee. And there's a parallel, dear sisters and brothers, do you see, with the Christian life. And unless you're different, like me, you have a bias to the instant. You have a bias to the easy. No, we, we do. We, we like a church where nobody's going to let me down, right? We like a church where there are no disappointments where everything is smooth and well-oiled. And isn't the church supposed to grow easy? Isn't it supposed to work easy? Timothy would be tempted to think that. And so Paul is saying, Timothy, when you face opposition, when you face disappointment, 
the grinding shouldn't surprise you. That's how God builds muscle into you and shapes you for greater things. As I was thinking about this, uh, I thought of a book I have in my library called The Joy. It's called The Call to Joy and Pain. And it's written by uh, somebody in Sri Lanka. His name is Ajif Fernando. And he quotes in that book, he quotes G.K. Chesterton. And uh, Chesterton says, if you boil it down, Jesus uh, promised his disciples three things. Three things. That they would be completely fearless. That they would be absurdly happy with a happiness that the world doesn't know. And that they would be in constant trouble. And all our three are needed for the gospel to impact. And he, he, then, he then speaks of a, a, a medical doctor, a man called George Harley. And uh, George Harley left his home country, United States, to go to Liberia with his wife who was pregnant. Uh, can you imagine? They reached the place where they were going to minister after walking for 17 days through kind of jungles. Uh, he serves there one year, three years, five years. Nobody responds. And every week his family meet for worship. But there's no single local African who comes to join them. And then, and then his son dies. And he himself has got to make a coffin. And he's got to take that coffin. He's got to go and bury his son. You might call it a, a kind of righteous suffering. A, a price paid for living holy. For the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he, as he was by that grave, overcome with grief, true story, he was sobbing. One man uh, came to him, pulled his head up by his hair, and looked at his face for a long time. And then he ran into the village crying, white man, white man, he cry like one of us. Next Sunday, the service was packed. By the way, Harley served in Liberia. For 35 years, but not before he lost his son. And when a bishop in his own denomination pointed that out, his response, referring to God, was he had a son too. He had a son too. You prepared to pay the price for following Jesus with all of your heart, like a good soldier, without compromise, Great sacrifice. Welcome to the disciple's life, the Christian life. Suffer well, not grudgingly, but then focus intently. It's our second major point, and, and not hesitantly. And it brings us very naturally, I think, to the first of three pictures that are used to illustrate how spiritual muscle is shaped. It's going to take the discipline of an athlete. It's going to take the perseverance and the diligence of a farmer. But he begins with the soldier, the devotion of the soldier. Look at verse 4. No one serving as a soldier, literally, no one soldiering entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life, which begs the question, what marks a good soldier out? Well, like a soldier, Timothy, aim for a single priority and not many. Now, I, I don't want to read too much into the image of soldier, except to say, if I may, that you cannot read the Bible and think that it has a low view of those whose vocation is in the military. There were soldiers then, active soldiers, just as there are soldiers today. And I ask you, would any of us like to live in a country where there was no trained army? I guess you could point to Iceland, which is part of NATO, but they have a peacekeeping force, and they have an air defense system, and they have a police tactical unit. The fact is, and the Bible realizes that if wars are going to take place in a fallen world, and if just wars are going to take place, it's not civilians who are going to win the day. You need an army who's trained. You need soldiers that are ready and equipped. And Paul, by the way, loved the metaphor. 1 Timothy 1, uh, verse 18, fight the good fight. In other words, get in the front line. You're a soldier. In Philippians 2, verse 25, he calls gentle Epaphroditus, 
the gentle messenger to the church. He calls him a fellow soldier. And in case we have any doubts about our weapons, well, you can read Ephesians 6. And we sang about it when, we, when the musicians led us. But I don't want you to miss, miss it. Here, uh, Paul isn't concerned about the soldier's offensive tactics as much as his attitude, his disposition. And, and um, I can say this because I served a little time in, the def in a defense force myself. W what is the most basic expectation of any good soldier? A single-minded devotion. He's not a careless person. You can't afford to be. He's a dedicated person. And if he or she must suffer, well, that's what they are going to be prepared to do. That's what they were prepared to do when they joined. Now, I know as well as, as you do that uh, techniques of warfare has, have changed. Today, you can be a soldier in a country, not, your, <laughs> not where you're battling, but in another country, and you can hit a button, and a drone can come and cause devastation. But please try and forget that and, and, and try and understand, you know, to make it real, try and go back to Paul's day. And in, in fact, there was a church father, his name was Tertullian, and he wrote, uh, he wrote a, a sermon called Address to Martyrs, and it was really an encouragement to Christians to stand firm for Jesus. And he said this, he said, no, no soldier comes to the war surrounded by luxuries, nor goes into action from a comfortable bedroom, but from the makeshift and narrow tent where every kind of hardness and severity and unpleasantness is found. And, and sisters and brothers, uh, I entered our own uh, army in South Africa as a national uh, service chaplain in 1990. And I can tell you that we were not spared because we were chaplains. I can tell you that we did basic training and I can tell you that as they shaved off our hair and they took away our civilian clothing and they gave us a uniform, we realized we might get a weekend pass, but we were not to forget we were first soldiers and then sons or brothers and sisters. Well, let's ask somebody serving in the war zone. I heard an interview on BBC with a Ukrainian soldier, a lady. And uh, as she was asked, well, why, why are you fighting? Why, why are you here? She didn't beat around the bush. She said, when a missile falls on a building, it kills everyone, men and women and children. And she was effectively saying something like, there's a war on, and this is my place. How could I be, how could I be anywhere else? And by the way, during World War II, that phrase was used often. When in the United Kingdom, people, uh, there were rations, and people were going without, and life was tough, uh, people would just say, there's a war on. And that justified any kind of suffering. So what are you saying, Paul, when you say that a good soldier shouldn't be involved in civilian affairs? But please don't, please don't read into this that Christians are to neglect their families and to neglect life and to go and live a hermit kind of life. That, that, is, not, that is not what it is meant here nor as much as I admire the example of uh, Jim Elliot, uh, do I think that he was right when he pointed out to his fiancée Elizabeth, uh, he pointed actually to this verse as a reason why they shouldn't be involved in a romantic relationship. Not exactly the way to win a woman's heart. It's not that Paul is saying we shouldn't have other allegiances. He's just saying that your first calling after loving the Lord, obviously, is to serve your families. But Timothy, this is priority. Timothy, don't get so caught up in 1,001 entanglements. Don't get so distracted that you lose sight of why you are where you are. Now listen, it reminded me of those who liked what they saw in Jesus. You remember those who came to him? And they saw that there was something about him and they said, Lord, you lead, I will follow. Luke chapter 9. Okay, Jesus says, follow me. And one says, give me time to go and bury my father. Now, that doesn't mean that his father had died. It may have taken another 10 years before his father died. It's just that he was saying, there are things I've got to do, places I've got to see. I'll follow you, but I want to do it when I'm ready. And Jesus responds, you remember what he said, let the dead bury their own dead, but you follow me. You follow me. He wasn't being callous. 
He was saying, let the spiritually dead, those who don't know me, bury the physically dead. But you know who I am. And if you want to follow me as Savior, here's your priority. Go and proclaim the kingdom now. Don't be distracted from the greater. Either I am king, or you want me as an add-on. Either you want to wear the uniform and just look good to be kind of part of the army because you got the uniform, or you're going to go and get into the trenches. And then he went on to say, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Brothers uh, and sisters, I'm the first to say that that service flows out of love for Jesus Christ. So when, when you make it your overarching desire, when, when, when you say like the psalmist does in Psalm 27 verse 4, this one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house, one thing he says, I seek, that I may dwell in the house. And that, that doesn't just mean sitting and being comfortable. It means, it means being part of the mission of the Lord all the days of my life. You, you, you will enter a wartime mentality. Th this will be wartime. And as, as, as a soldier, maybe you need to ask yourself, as I do, what are the, some of the things, even some of the good things, might I need to cut out of my life because they are deflecting me from total commitment to the Savior who's given everything. Single-minded devotion. John Piper says, um, and I can't put it better, there's nothing that makes God more supreme and more central in worship. And don't we want to be a people like this? He says, there's, there's nothing that makes God more supreme and more central in worship than when a people are utterly persuaded that nothing, not money, or prestige, or leisure, or family, or job, or health, or sports, or toys, or friends, nothing is going to bring satisfaction to their sinful, guilty, aching hearts beside Jesus. Timothy is persuaded, are we? And you know, when you aim for the single priority and not many, it's because you are serving the audience of one all the time. And I think this is what helps the soldier to keep priorities in line. Here's what will help him not to be entangled in anything that will distract him because he knows he has an audience. And rather than get entangled in a civilian affairs, he tries to please the one who enlisted him. Now, I don't want to skip over that. Can I go back to Charles Atlas? Or think of uh, anybody who's uh, committed to a sport, maybe, or to a cause. If you're utterly devoted to sports or to a cause, you can very easily become a, ma a machine. But to whom is Timothy devoted to? The one who called and enlisted him. Look, Timothy, if God is both perfect and wise, if he's going to ask you to do nothing that's contrary to his love and his wisdom, then is it too much to give your all to him? I, I, I love this personal touch. Timothy on his own is not going to be bold. He's a meek guy. Timothy has a bent, maybe, to lend his ears to public opinion, to comparisons. So, so here's a reminder to all of us today, you know, as we live the Christian life. There's one drumbeat, just one drumbeat that we must march to. There is one person to please. And as you keep him before you, you have nothing to prove, you have nothing to gain, and you have nothing to lose. The audience of one. When we get to chapter 4, we're going to come across a man called Demas. And the sad thing about Demas, we read about him in 2 Timothy 4 verse 9, is that because he loved this world, Paul says, he deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. And I thought about that for a moment. There's no hint that, that Demas was apostate. That's not what the New Testament says. And there's no hint that he was a heretic. In fact, he wasn't a lightweight. He would have traveled with Paul. And he would have been with Paul through many ups and downs. And maybe he went to Thessalonica because it was more comfortable there. And, and, and it wasn't just as risky to be amongst those believers. And if that's so, then the difference between a bad soldier and a good one is to whom are you lending your ears? 
younger people today, to whom are you lending your ears? And who is it that you want to please? Let me end with two applications. Maybe there's somebody here and you, you're trying to work out what it, we've all been through this. What, what does it mean to be a Christian and to follow the call of God? The Bible presumes that all of us have faith in someone or something. Even if it's my own self-assessment of myself or my own ambitions, we've all got faith. Do you remember the call of Abraham? At one point, God says to him, Genesis 17, verse 1, I am God Almighty. He didn't have to prove it. I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully. Follow my lead only and be blameless. You see what's going on? Behind the voice of God is the eye of God, and behind the eye that sees Abraham is the face, and behind the face is the heart. What does it mean to follow the call of God and to follow Jesus? Stop listening to yourself, to your ambitions. Shift your awareness to the, to the audience of one, the one before whom one day you will stand and give an account. Follow him only and follow him wholeheartedly. And that is what it means a disciple of Jesus. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Second application to we who've enlisted and are Christians. And believe me, I apply this to my own heart. When we serve the Lord and others, and, and I just presume if you're a Christian, you're serving. I, I'm, I'm presuming you're not sitting in a hot tub. When we serve the Lord and others, do we do this because it's kind of expected or because actually, man, I, I just can't do anything else? I know for a fact that some of you dear brothers and sisters, you're doing all kinds of things behind the scenes. And I know too that <laughs> it really doesn't matter to you whether it's noticed or publicized. Why is that? Because if we're noticed by the audience that matters, namely God, that's all that really matters. And, and I want to encourage all of you faithful soldiers today as you, as you fly the flag of Jesus through serving the body. Maybe it's in a teaching ministry or in ushering or music or children or youth or in the kitchen. You fill on what I've left out. You fill in what I've left out. Don't lose sight of whom you are serving. We can so easily think of church in terms of our serving God. That would be backwards. It starts with being served by God. And that's the gospel. Because the more I'm satisfied in Him and all He's revealed Himself to be in Jesus, then I no longer say, should I serve? I say, Lord, where may I serve you? And how may I serve you? And show me how to follow you. Like the great soldier of Jesus, Hudson Taylor put it, I used to ask God to help me. And then I asked if I might help Him. And I ended up by asking Him to do His work through me. That's the way, sisters and brothers, to be a spiritually muscular Christian. As we close, are we going to go for the let go and let God approach? Is that how we're going to grow? That's not how a good soldier operates. God will do his work through us and sometimes despite us. But I want to be a good soldier. I want to be all in. I, I want to suffer well, don't you? And not grudgingly. I want to focus more intently. And as we come to the table, as we're going to do in a moment, um, do, do we understand that, that we can do that because of the one man, Jesus, who said, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Father. I'm willing to go where they are, and I'm willing to fight the greatest battle of all. I'm willing to take on the world and the flesh and the devil. And because there was no sin in his devoted life, he paid the price so that we may be part of his forever family and part of the great victorious band of soldiers who will win the day because the captains won. Let's pray. Um, Lord, in verse 7 of uh, this chapter, you say to Timothy to reflect and think about these things, and it's, it's very easy to lose the impact of the word 
once it is uh, preached. And we don't want to do that. We want it to lodge in our hearts. We want it to search us. None of us here have arrived. The best of Christians are those who are sinners, who are saved by grace. We all need to be challenged to ask ourselves if we are where you want us and if we are all in with all that we are for a God who's always all in for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's anybody here and you're not yet a Christian, you've heard today that there is an excellent soldier who came and laid down his life so that we might even begin to live in such a way. And all you need to do where you are is put all of your confidence and faith, not in a church or a denomination, not in the faith of a parent or the faith of a sister or a brother, but put your faith in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and ask him to receive you. Repent from your sin and trust in him and you will be both his child and his soldier. And Lord, may we who know you and love you aim to please you in all things. And as we continue to prepare our hearts to remember the great work of the Lord Jesus Christ, may we see Jesus more clearly, love him more dearly, follow him more nearly, day after day, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing together, and uh, as we are singing the last verse, will those who are serving at the table alongside me please uh, come and stand at the table.
are on the table of the king. And so with thankfulness and faith we rise to respond and to remember to follow in the steps of Christ as his body here on earth as we share in his suffering we proclaim Christ will come again and will join in the feast of heaven around the of the King as we share in His suffering we proclaim Christ will come again and will join in the feast of heaven around the table of the King around the table Well, please, please be seated. And uh, today we have thought about uh, soldiers. And I couldn't help but think of uh, one verse that speaks very clearly of why we can be enlisted in this great army. There was a time when, when you and I didn't want, we had no desire to be in, in the family of God. Uh, we didn't want to be in the, in the army. We actually we preferred our own rags of righteousness, our own rags of self-righteousness, to wearing a, a uniform that only Christ could give us. So this table reminds us why we are who we are as, as the family of God. Don't, don't take it lightly. You, you, if you're like me, you've come to the table conscious of where you failed uh, in, in this week. Uh, have any of us loved the Lord our God with all of our hearts? Have any of us loved others as we really should? And then if we're reminded of why we, we must have Jesus Christ. We must have his righteousness. And I'm reminded that Jesus was single-minded, that he was willing not to fight from the back lines, but he came right up uh, to the front. And uh, sisters and brothers, it was for you and me that he took on flesh. It was for you and me that he lived as an obedient child. Think about that. Totally obedient child with parents who were not perfect parents who were sinners. Uh, he was tempted by the devil, devil at every point, but as a best soldier, he overcame. He was ridiculed, but he forgave. He was treated unjustly. He didn't strike back. And he went to the cross without flinching so that he might rise again on the third day. And here's how Hebrews 2 verse 10 describes that. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation. The word pioneer there means captain or leader. Should make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now, it's not, of course, that Jesus had to do something before he became perfect. It's simply that through all his suffering and obedience, God brought his work for us, the perfect work of the cross, to completion. And there's tremendous comfort. There's tremendous comfort and peace in that. What when we fail to be good soldiers? We don't sit in the place of shame. Romans says we stand in the place of grace. As you, as you eat the bread today, as you, as you drink the cup, remember who you are today because of him. Remember who you are. You, you've been saved completely from the fall. Completely. You've not just been given a uniform for his army, you've been given an identity in his family. He couldn't love you more. He'll never love you less. He never forgets a single thing. But he says, I choose to remember your sins no more. Forgiven 100% past sins, present sins, future sins. 
and then we eat and drink together. Why? Because this is not an individual table. This is a table for sons and daughters who are being brought to glory. We can't do this on our own. We need Jesus Christ, and we need one another. I want you to take a few moments of uh, silence before Rion leads us in prayer. And I want you to just, in the quietness of your heart, praise, thank, thank your captain, thank the captain of your salvation for all he's done for you. And because he is a God of forgiveness, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive. And this is the moment in the quietness of your heart where you can bring those sins to him and he will cleanse from all unrighteousness. A few moments. Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, slain for us, and we remember the promise made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross. Holy Father, thank you for your amazing grace and love that you bestow upon us. Father, thank you that we can come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, and just worship you, and just understand the amazing God that you are. Father, thank you for this body that we can be together today. Amen. Father, to remember what you have sacrificed through your son for us. Father, and, uh, we ask you that, that you open up our spiritual hearts and minds and ears and, and eyes. Father, to understand what you've done for us. Father, that we can live in grace. And Father, just to live out our lives, our eyes focused on you, accepting Christ and what he's done for us. Father, thank you that we can come together today to, to remember what you've done for us. Father, so that we can have this starting point to build our spiritual mm -hmm. muscle. Mm -hmm. Father, that we can become strong soldiers for you. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we're going to uh, receive the bread, and uh, then we'll eat together as a token of our unity uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So keep it. And we'll eat uh, together when all have received.
thanksgiving. supper Jesus took a cup and said this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this every time you drink it in remembrance of me Lord uh, we today remember not an institution we remember not a philosophy we don't even remember a set of teachings even though the teachings of Jesus are good you said do this in remembrance of me and today we thank you, Lord Jesus, for the perfection of your life. We thank you that you indeed are the lamb that has been slain. We thank you for your perfect blood which was shed so that we, the guilty, may be freed. We who lived our lives in bondage to the world and the flesh and the devil might be liberated to live as the children of God. What cost, what sacrifice, what magnificence. Help us to bear that in mind and help us to understand the implications, Lord, as uh, we live before you in our context, in our world, in our communities, in our families, in the witness that we bear to be salt and light for you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to as well retain the cup and then again drink together. And 
So with thankfulness and faith we rise to respond and to remember our call to follow in the steps of Christ as his body here on earth as we share in his suffering we proclaim Christ will come again and we join in the feast of heaven around the table of the king Before we uh, drink together, we remind ourselves of the beauty of community and we think today of brothers and sisters in countries where they cannot meet as easily and freely as us. And we pray that in some way they may know the great uh, result of the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ and that you will be more than sufficient for them. We pray that equally for all of our missionaries in different con countries and continents, whatever their particular challenges, that they may know exceptional peace and strength today as we give you thanks and as we drink together in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, amen. So while the uh, ushers are going to be picking up the uh, uh, glasses and so on, I'm going to share a few announcements. Uh, we shouldn't be keeping you that long. And the first uh, really has to do, let me get to it, with a great response from you ladies for the ladies' conference. So we have over 30 ladies registered, and there may be more. And remember that uh, ladies are going to charter a bus. So uh, you do need to register, and uh, if you'd like to be part of this group, then uh, speak to Cindy, and let's continue to pray for that. Now, last week, Andre spoke about our uh, choir community project, and we don't need to say more about that. You have an insert. Uh, think about whether God may want you to serve by using your voice, or if you have an instrument, and all the details are there, and uh, he'll be happy to uh, speak to you about that. Then uh, one or two folk have spoken to me about baptism, and God willing, we hope to have a baptismal service on Resurrection Sunday. I need to know if you want to be baptized, and uh, we have a class that we can work through together. And then uh, for those who've asked about membership, March the 2nd, you need to note that, Saturday, March the 2nd, we have a Discovery IBC Brussels team. And then uh, some people sometimes say, well, you know, I see there are a lot of new faces around and I'm not sure who this person is or that person is. A great way of getting to know them, uh, if you're not already serving in an existing ministry, is to join our welcome team. Uh, really, uh, it's, uh, th there's not a great deal <laughs> about it on the surface level, but welcoming people is a wonderful ministry. So... Uh, I know that uh, uh, Kaylin uh, can give you more information. Uh, I think that Maxine is in India. You can speak to her, but you can speak to Kaylin. And I'd encourage you, uh, if you're not yet part of a team, uh, speak to us about being part of the welcome team. Now, I know we had two birthdays at least in the week. So, Andre, I see you in the back there. You need to stand. Yeah, and and uh, Joanna, it was your birthday too? Okay, all right, yeah. All right, anybody else that uh, one may have missed? Okay. Great. Cherise, remind me of your daughter's name. Lizette. Lizette. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Okay. So here's the verse from uh, Psalm 103. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. What a, what a great thing it is, Lord. We think of all of these images, being children in your family, uh, being soldiers in your army, and then being uh, the sheep of your pasture. Uh, you are the great shepherd who knows uh, each one of your sheep. You know these who stand before us today. You know their lives. 
and all that we see of Jesus in them. You also know the purposes and your plan and uh, your purpose and plan that you have for them in the year that lies ahead. And thank you that uh, while we may not know everything, we do know that your goodness and your mercy will follow them all the days, not just of this year, but the days that you give to them. Bless them abundantly, we pray, as we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, we're going to welcome visitors. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him.